If you've ever watched Top Gun or any other film that involves super speeds, such as CW's The Flash, you know, that show that started off good and then became an absolute laughing stock of poor CGI and horrible writing. If you have, then you've probably heard of the term mock speeds, or mock followed by some number. So then, what exactly is a mock? Well, if you haven't guessed it by now, mock is used as a unit of measurement for speed. Not velocity, mind you. However, unlike other units of measurement, mocks aren't a universally constant unit of measurement for speed. Mocks use the speed of sound as its reference. And the speed of sound is something that's dependent on a variety of environmental factors, such as air density and temperature. And speaking of units of measurement, I'm only going to be using a metric system throughout this entire video just to screw with the Americans. Anyways, Mach 1 marks the speed of sound, how fast sound moves in the current environment essentially, and Mach 1 also marks the sound barrier. The mathematical equation for converting to Mach speeds is m equals u divided by c, with m being the number of Machs, u being the current speed of the subject you're trying to measure, and c being the current speed of sound at the subject's current location. And for finding the speed of sound at a specific location, we use the equation v equals the square root of gamma times r times t divided by m, with v being the speed of sound, gamma being the adiabatic index, which is just an index for recording the behavior of gases reacting to stimuli, r being the specific gas constant, t being the temperature in kelvins, and m being the molar mass of the gas. So what can we do with all of these equations? Well, we can now convert other units of speed into Machs, like kilometers. So, for example, let's say we're trying to measure how fast Usain Bolt runs on top of Mount Fuji in terms of Machs. We would first need to find the speed of sound at the peak of Mount Fuji, which means even more mass. The coldest recorded temperature that the summit of Mount Fuji has ever reached is around negative 38 degrees Celsius. We'll be using this value for the sake of simplicity. I do not want to spend more time collecting data on finding the average temperature at the top of Mount Fuji. But anyways, negative 38 degrees just converts to 235.15 kelvins. And the adiabatic index for dry air is valued at 1.4. And since the adiabatic value really doesn't change that much regardless of altitudes, we will just be using this value. The specific gas constant is, well, a constant. So it equals 8.31446218 joules per kelvin per mole, which I'll round to 8.314 since it's quite a mouthful. And the gas in question this time is air. The molar mass of air is 28.9647 grams per mole, which converts into 0.02897 kilograms per mole. So M equals 0.02897 kilograms per mole. So now, if we plug all of our values into the equation, it gives us the square root of 1.4 times 8.314 times 235.15 divided by 0 0.02897, giving us V, which now equals 307.374101232. So roughly 307.37 meters per second. Do some converting and we get 1,106,532 meters per hour, which is 1,106.532 kilometers per hour. Which sounds about right since sound travels slower at higher altitudes and lower temperatures. But it's probably better if you just take everything I just said as a grain of salt. I'm not exactly good at math. Regardless of how well I may be, I may as well finish calculating everything. With Usain Bolt's highest recorded speed being at 44.7 km per hour, we get 44.7 divided by 1106.532, which equals 0 0.04039648198815. So Usain would run at approximately Mach 0.04 at the top of Mount Fuji. That being said, Usain would most definitely not be able to run at his maximum speed with the extreme conditions at the summit of Mount Fuji, but it's still fun to think that Usain Bolt can run at 4% the speed of sound. Again, my math is probably horribly wrong. Also, if we wanted Usain Bolt to run at Mach 1, 
you would have to run a negative 272.7662746656 degrees Celsius. So basically Usain Bolt would have to run at his top speed in essentially absolute zero temperatures. Sounds fun, right? Now, where were we? Ah, right. The sound barrier. So then, what exactly is the sound barrier and what does it mean to break it? The sound barrier is essentially a wall of air resistance. As the name implies, it's a barrier that marks the threshold for the speed of sound. Now, on to breaking the sound barrier. Yet again, the name pretty much tells you everything. Breaking the sound barrier means going faster than the speed of sound. Now, keep in mind that going the speed of sound doesn't mean breaking the sound barrier. You have to actually go faster than the speed of sound. It's sort of like surface tension in a way, I suppose. If you were to somehow go the exact same speed as the speed of sound, you wouldn't break the sound barrier. And when I say exact, I mean exact. As in absolutely perfect speeds with pinpoint accuracy down to the absolute last digit. Theoretically speaking, it is possible to accomplish such a feat, but it would require immense amounts of luck and precision to pull it off. You're better off trying to flip a coin to land on its side. You would have to go at exactly Mach 1 point infinite zeros. If you so much as happen to pass the speed of sound by even a mere fraction of a unit, you'll break the sound barrier. I'm talking about an infinitesimally small number. No matter how much faster you're going than the speed of sound, as long as you surpass it, the sonic boom will occur. So then, what exactly is a sonic boom? A sonic boom is a sound produced by breaking the sound barrier. Which, if you remember correctly, would be when an object moves faster than the speed of sound. The science behind a sonic boom is fairly straightforward. When any scene with a mass is in motion, it pushes aside molecules in the direction it's headed. Air molecules are normally dispersed and pushed to the side when an object goes through them, and are limited to going at the speed of sound because that's how fast it can transfer energy to other molecules. So when an object moves faster than the speed of sound, the corresponding air molecules are forced to go faster than the speed of sound. And because the air molecules are getting pushed away at supersonic speeds, something they weren't designed to do, the air molecules don't get pushed away quickly enough and start stacking and piling on top of each other, and building up pressure until it reaches its breaking point. The air molecules don't get dispersed fast enough, which allows the waves of air molecules to collide with each other. And then all the pressure is suddenly released all of a sudden, resulting in a shockwave we hear as a sonic boom. A common misconception about the sonic boom is that it's a one-time occurrence that only happens when an object breaks the sound barrier for the first time. If you understood any of the mechanisms behind a sonic boom I just explained now, you would know that it isn't a one-time boom, and rather a continuous series of booms. As long as the object is moving faster than the speed of sound, air molecules will continuously repeat the cycle of stacking on top of each other building up pressure and releasing that pressure by erupting into shock waves. The only reason this misconception exists is because people only ever hear sonic booms when we're on the ground, not moving at the same speed of the object. So the spectators only get to hear a singular boom. If you were to hear a sonic boom, then somehow immediately teleport ahead of the object that produced a boom, you would hear a secondary sonic boom after the object passes you again. Sonic booms will constantly happen as long as the object in motion remains at supersonic speeds. The intervals between the sonic booms are also part of why spectators may only hear one boom. The human ear often takes quick successions of noise and compresses them into a singular sound. And the intervals between sonic booms are short enough for the human brain to compress those sounds into a singular boom. Now, for something interesting I discovered while making this video, Thunder is something that's actually quite similar to a sonic boom. But it's not exactly a sonic boom. While yes, thunder is caused by lightning, which moves at the speed of light and therefore faster than the speed of sound. But since lightning is an intangible form of energy, it basically has no mass other than photons, which are negligible. And if you still remember, a sonic boom is created by an object with mass pushing aside air molecules at supersonic speeds resulting in a shock wave. Well, thunder does pretty much the same thing. 
But instead of using mass to push aside the air molecules, it uses heat. The heat from a lightning bolt is intense enough that it rapidly heats up its surroundings, causing rapid expansion of air molecules, resulting in a similar phenomenon as sonic booms, where air molecules start stacking on top of each other and bam, you get a shockwave, giving us the boom we call thunder. Anyways, back to talking about mocks. Everything after Mach 1 is pretty simple. Just take whatever number is after Mach and then multiply it with the current speed of sound. And you get your speed. Then there are Mach number categories, which we obviously use to categorize Mach speeds, with the categories being subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic. Subsonic speeds are when you move at any speed under Mach 1. Transonic speeds are kind of that weird and unnecessary category that just makes things more confusing. But by definition, it's the speeds near the speed of sound. So any scene between Mach 0.8 and Mach 1.2. You can probably just forget this category ever existed. Supersonic speeds are when you move faster than Mach 1, all the way up until Mach 5, where you enter the category of hypersonic speeds which is the highest category of speed that uses sound as its reference. Hypersonic speeds range from Mach 5 to Mach 10. Any scene above 10 is also technically hypersonic, but we tend to stop using sonic speeds for reference after we surpass Mach 10, and start using space terms like re-entry speeds or orbital velocity. You can still use mocks, it's just uncommon since mocks usually get replaced by cooler sounding names. So you could technically say that you move at subsonic speeds. It sounds better, but you're still slow as hell. Go exercise, you bum. And as usual, here's some bonus facts. The speed of light is around 800,000 mocks. So yeah, the speed of light is basically 800,000 times faster than the speed of sound. Which is why we do that countdown scene for estimating how far lightning is, by recording the time elapsed between the flash and the boom. And as for fun fact number two, meteors hit Earth at speeds anywhere between Mach 30 and Mach 200, with some going even faster, which means that the source of a meteor's destructive force primarily comes from its speed. I don't know what you can do with this new knowledge, but have fun I guess. Anyways, that's it for this video. There's probably way more I didn't cover, but this is good enough by my standards.